today's reading roll, y'all, is coming to you from a very dark and gray central Indiana, but a good day nonetheless. I'm really excited about this um, episode because I'm going to talk to Darcy Little Badger about her book, Alatsue. One of the things that really struck me about our conversation is how the talk that we had together revealed things about her own book that she didn't even realize were in there because they're just so hidden to us because of the way that we think about place and how place interacts with us in terms of our identity building and the world building that authors do in their novels. Dr. Little Badger is a fabulous person and so much fun to talk to and I love her imagination and also the way that her PhD in the STEM field fuels that imagination in a way that maybe we don't often think about. Um, But I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I hope you do too. I recorded this interview, um, checks notes, a long time ago, but because of the move, I've just now been able to get to posting it. And I was so excited and had so much fun listening back to our conversation. And I just hope that you have as much fun listening to it as I did. Okay, let's get into the interview. Thanks for being here. Hello and welcome to the final installment of our series on the Whippoorwill award-winning Alatsue by Dr. Darcy Little Badger. I am so excited to talk with her today. Dr. Little Badger is a Lipan Apache writer with a PhD in oceanography. Her critically acclaimed debut novel, La- a Lats Away, won a Whippoorwill Award for Rural YA Literature and was featured in Time Magazine as one of the best 100 fantasy books of all time. A Lats Away also won the Locus Award for Best First Novel and is a Nebula, Ignite, and Lodestar finalist. Her second fantasy novel, which just came out recently, right? A Snake Falls to Earth received a Nebula Award, an Ignite Award, and a Newbery Honor, and is on the National Book Awards long list. Dr. Little Badger is married to a veterinarian named Taryn, and I first met Dr. Little Badger at NCTE last November because she was on the Whippoorwill panel that I was facilitating, and we had a fascinating conversation about rurality and rural language practices and rural books, and so I'm super excited to get to talk with her again today. Hi, and welcome, Dr. Little Badger. Thank you so much Hi. for being here with me. It's great to be here, and it's great to see you again. Although Likewise. this time over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and not in person this time, but still fun. So the first question that I ask everyone who comes on this podcast, um, because it is my obsession, um, is if you would tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you think that's shaped who you are as both a person and a writer. Yeah, and uh, when I was a child, my parents actually moved a lot, which is weird because they're teachers. So it's not a job you usually associate with uh, going to a different place every couple of years. I guess when I was young, they were students and then later became a high school and a college teacher. Uh, so I I was born in Minnesota, but didn't spend a lot of time there. So we moved to Malaysia for a couple of years and then down to Iowa, where I spent most of my elementary school. We went up to uh, Castleton, Vermont after that for junior high, then down to Texarkana, Texas for high school. And then since then, after college, I've uh, we now I kind of live between San Marcos, Texas, and Corona del Mar, California. So it's uh, it's it's been an interesting experience seeing a lot of different places in the United States. But I have to say that I've never lived in a city before. So I don't know. Maybe maybe someday. <laughs> I, I gotta say I love cities but they overwhelm me. <laughs> so I have, I'm very impressed by people who could, could live in those. <laughs> Likewise, when I first came down to Austin, so not too far from San Marcos um, to go to school, I lived on the outskirts. And even then, like, you know, I'm used to, I grew up on a, an 80 acre farm. So I'm used to like traffic being like somebody hauling anhydrous at a really <laughs> slow pace, you know, <laughs> and then it taking you, you know, like if it's 60 miles away, you're probably going to take a highway and it's going to be 60 minutes, you know, like 
Um, but to get from my house, which was not very far north of Austin, um, to campus, it was almost two hours, um, every day. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that that was going to be the case when I picked where I was going to (laughs) live. Um, and so that commute was intense and something that I didn't even think about, um, or no to to wonder about when I was trying to figure out where to live. So I, I feel you on that for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of a lot of times just the the ability to get one place to another without a car, it just gets so much more difficult. Like my brother, he he usually doesn't he he has a license, but he doesn't drive. So he used to have to like when he worked uh, at Target, he'd have to bike like miles. And I was like, <laughs> um, I I don't know if I'd have the dedication to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> to go biking. <laughs> so a lot's away, especially um, focuses a lot on ancestral stories and s- stories that are definitely deeply connected to place, but also kind of travel um, with the people that they sort of belong to, you know? Um, and so thinking about how you moved around a bit and thinking about, um, the book, how do you, I like, do you feel like those are kind of connected? Like, do you feel like, um, the lip and culture sort of, um, is infused in that way in your books or is that something that isn't connected really to your experience at all you you just decided to put it in the novel yeah and so the the lip on apache traditionally live in lived in the area that's texas but also kind of northern mexico and although we did have a lifestyle where we moved throughout the year essentially following where the food was we stayed within that the southern area um, so I, I have lived in a lot of areas of Texas, like College Station was where I went to get my PhD. Um, my family is mostly in McAllen, Texas on my mom's side. So I've spent a lot of time there, especially uh, my grandmother had land there that I would visit. Um, unfortunately, uh, when, when she passed away, we lost that. But so compare that in the in the southern Texas to where I lived in Texarkana, I've gotten a good idea of what the, the state is like. But I find that a lot of times I write about Texas. And so far, all of my books have been set there. A lot of my short stories have as well. And I think back when you when you talk about ancestral stories, part of me wonders if that's because these these traditional stories that I w- was raised with, um, they tend to, you know, they take place, they were inspired by the world around the people who were sharing them. And that was this area we now know <laughs> as Texas um, and even uh, the northern area of Mexico. Uh, and and that really influenced me as, as I was growing up and learning that I wanted to be a storyteller and just all the different ways that stories can be told. I was also enriched by the setting that I came to be familiar with by living in Texas. And I think those the double thing, just the, the ancestral aspect, but also my personal experience, um, they just combine to make it a, a great setting for a lot of these books that I'm writing. Yeah, that reminds me of something that um, Jeff Zentner, who was also on the Whippoorwill panel, mm-hmm. um, talked about in my first interview with him is that uh, sort of like the genetic memory of a place because mm-hmm like my, my entire dad's family is from Appalachia. They're from East Tennessee. And, um, I didn't grow up there. My first memory was formed in Tennessee at Dale Hollow Lake. Um, and I spent a lot of time around my dad's family. And so whenever I get near the mountains, um, I, I have this overwhelming sense of home that doesn't make any sense to me because I've never lived there you know? And so he was talking about like genetic memory and how it's inherited and how, um, Mm -hmm. you know, even though it doesn't seem to make sense logically, it doesn't have to, if that's, you know, the feeling that you get. And so, um, I, I feel deeply connected to the things that happen in Mm -hmm. Appalachia. I feel deeply connected to Appalachian language and Appalachian people and culture, cultural practices, um, and literature, which is why I listen to read Appalachia, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Um, so even though, you know, I've never lived there, I've never been from there. I have visited there a lot and I do have family who still live there. Um, 
but I never lived there myself. And so like, I think that's interesting, right? How, like how, how family stories, because I grew up hearing them about living in the holler and they had their own coal mine and they, you know, played on the river. And, um, my great grandfather worked for the WPA, which is who built Dale hollow dam. Um, you know, like I grew up hearing those stories and I, and so I think in that way too, connecting to my ancestral stories and my, you know, where my ancestors came from, um, before they moved up to Indiana, I, I like to call myself an Appalachian infused Hoosier. That's usually how I refer to myself. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, I, I think I connect with what you're saying about like, you know, even if you move around a lot or you've never necessarily, mm-hmm. and at least you've lived in your, you know, you've lived in Texas, you've lived where your people are from. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, I, I think that that's, I think that that totally makes sense. And, you know, I yeah. kind of, no, absolutely. Like so much of who we are is shaped by our family and, and where the roots are. And I was just thinking like today, <laughs> my mom made, so she made pizza with uh, yucca and soleil blooms. And these are like, these grow in Texas. And I, I was just thinking all the things I'd learned from her about how to like live off the land and stuff. I really couldn't apply that if I was to go, for example, in Minnesota where I was born and spent uh, my baby years, <laughs> like I would just be very lost because um, that's not what I've learned from my my mother and and who she learned from her mother and father and going back, you know. So it's it's just so so much of those little things shape us. And I just have to say, like I have goosebumps because I have tried so hard to have a garden here in Texas. Yeah. And the soil, I don't understand it. I don't understand the soil. In Indiana, if you drop an heirloom tomato seed on the ground, it's going to grow. You know, yes. like like <laughs> the soil is rich and it's, you know, we get a lot of rain. And so like the one, that's one of the reasons why I started to think about place and how place affects us, how place affects our identity building and mm-hmm. how we interact with the world because our connection to the land is so important. And my entire family has been farmers and factory workers my whole life. And I used to, my papa taught me how far to put a seed down. I remember going to the garden and him showing me how to work the land and how to pick corn and how to tell when it's ready and how to tell when a tomato's ready and you pick it off and you wipe it off on your shirt. <laughs> yeah. and the first bite of a sun ripened tomato and it's delicious. It's the best <laughs> thing ever. And I cannot find a good tomato in Texas. Um, and so like, that's just, it's frustrating to me because mm-hmm. I wanted to have that kind of connection for my kids but I can't explain to them how to live off this land because I don't know how you know yeah that that's that's true and it's also like um it's hard and I guess it depends really what part of Texas you're you're in but even like my my brother in hill country Mm -hmm. he he knowing what he knows about how difficult it can be like um he lost a lot of his plants during that that like ice storm recently it's it's just it, it could be definitely Indiana is just like, oh, it just flourishes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm 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 in Temple. So I'm mm-hmm. between like Waco, Dallas, and Austin. Oh. And so I'm like on the cusp of like like everything around Austin is ranch because you can't grow things in the soil. Yeah. There's corn around here. It doesn't look like the corn from where I'm from, but there is <laughs> corn here and it can be grown, but I think you have to have a, a knowledge of how to mm-hmm irrigate and fertilize and stuff that I don't have because that's not where I'm from um so anyway like I just (laughs) I just have a deep personal connection to what you're talking about that has frustrated me to know it so instead of growing things I'm raising things and I've got hens and we have we've got got five chickens and so my kids at least get to interact with livestock in some way um but yeah, I just, I have been immensely frustrated because mm-hmm. I don't understand this land. And I, yeah. you know, if we had to, if this was like, if this was back in the day and, and we had to subsist off the land, my family would die. <laughs> because oh, no. I, don't know, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> don't worry. Like the, I, I hope that people would like help you out. They'll be like, here, we'll, yeah. we'll help you. <laughs> maybe, maybe they would. <laughs> yeah, maybe they would. Um, so you mentioned your PhD in oceanography, which Mm -hmm. I think is so cool. Um, 
And I'm curious about like, and I think I saw you say something because I follow all of your social media. I think I saw you say something about how like you're, um, you're finally writing a book or you're finally doing something that your, your PhD in oceanography is coming in handy. So I was curious about like how that sort of influences the way you write and what you write. Yes. Uh, so I studied plankton. <laughs> There's this type of plankton that makes red tides in the Gulf of Mexico. So when I was getting my PhD, I looked at the the transcriptome or the, the genes that they were expressing. And we were just curious why these plankton make a neurotoxin. Um, so we were trying to look at their genetics to understand like what is the purpose of this neurotoxin um, because it can it can get into shellfish while they're filter feeding during red tides and then it it ends up making people uh, sick if they eat those shellfish um so i i have this biological oceanography background but also as an undergrad i did a lot of work with looking at sea level indicators and how the sea level has changed in the past 400,000 years ago and during interglacial and glacial periods and and trying to use that to project how local sea level might change in the future. So we did uh, various things that were related with ocean acidification to so climate change, in other words. Uh, and my recent book, A Snake Falls to Earth, takes place in the near future. And what I was trying to think is, what will Texas be like in, in the near future in this alternate world? Um, and a lot of times with science, when you're trying to predict things, what you can do is is give a range. So like, depending on what happens between now and then, we think that the future will be between this and that, you know, like in terms of rainfall or hurricane strength and just all sorts of stuff. So it can be very difficult. And what I found with writing fiction is I'm creating a world where we aren't we aren't giving ranges. We're saying this world exists. This is what happens. And it was kind of scary to get over that hub and be like, Darcy, you're writing a fantasy book. This is fiction. You don't have to like get this peer reviewed and you could, you could give yourself that, that, uh, the luxury of just using your imagination. And so that's what I did with a snake falls to earth. So obviously a lot of things about that book are totally fantasy and it takes place in an alternate world. And there's, uh, cottonmouth snake people walking around. And so this is definitely not a scientific paper, but I did find that a lot of things that I learned about uh, specifically like Texas and the way that, because the, the hurricanes in this book. And so as an oceanographer, I learned about hurricanes and, and the things that might influence their strength. And so that all played into enriching this world, but also it's definitely not the papers that I would write for uh, scientific journals. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, um, we're always reading and writing through our experiences and everything that we have, all of the knowledge that we've worked to build and, um, and create. And so I think that that's really interesting to see how, you, you know, your, your background um, in biological sciences is influencing the way that you're writing. I think that's really cool. Um, would you classify Snake Falls to Earth a rural book? Um, I guess it, it does take place in, I would say, yeah, because for the human side, it definitely is. It takes place in two different worlds, and one of them is the secondary fantasy world. So that I wouldn't say, but the human lives in a rural area of Texas that was, again, in, inspired by places that I have lived and visited. Um, so I would say so, yeah. Okay, so, but thinking about that, you know, thinking about whether or not a snake falls to earth was, we sort of talked about this at the Whippoorwill panel, but I think for people who weren't able to attend NCT and weren't able to um, be sort of party to that conversation, um, when you were writing Alatsue, did you think about it as a rural book? And um, and if not, like, what do we what do we feel like that means, you know? I don't know. This is something that I keep thinking about. I didn't really think about much in terms of uh, the category that Latsoe would fall in as I was writing it. Um, but the place for that one is important because it does take place in South Texas, which is you know where all my family's from. So to me, it was almost natural that my first book would 
would be there. Um, but I also didn't really think like, is it a fantasy or a mystery or, you know, that those types of things. What I do like though, is about later when readers read something and, and categorize it, that helps other people find the types of books that they're looking for. Um, so I'm glad that, that it was recognized as being taking place in a rural uh, location and just being really informed by that location. Uh, and yeah, for me, it, it really is all about the setting, the world that a book takes place, but really how much of an influence that has on the characters and what happens to them. And it, it, I can't uh, really overstate how important place is um, to the humans who live there. Yeah. And I think setting is sort of one of those, um, I don't want to, it kind of felt like most English teachers that I knew at least treated it like a throwaway thing. Like it was like mm. a, it was like a fill in the blank question. This book takes place in blank. Right. Yeah. And so like, that was the extent and, or if they really got fancy with it, students were doing like shoebox dioramas or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, but I felt like at least as a student, um, mm -hmm. There was very little consideration for how the type of place that a book and and that the characters of the world of the book interacted mm -hmm. with. Like, there was very little critical consideration of why that was important. And so my follow-up question to that first question about whether or not A Lots Away was a rural book is how do you think the story would have been affected? How would it be different if the setting were changed to like a more urban space? Oh, that's, that's an interesting one. I think that Ellie would have, so like something I often say about why I made this a young adult book is I, I, I'd i say, I this is essentially a story about a character seeking justice for a family and the odds are against her. And her being a teenager makes it even more difficult. And I use it as example, like she wants to research something um and she has to ask her parents can I borrow your car so I could drive down to this library and that goes back to that question of of public transportation and how easy it is to get to specialized locations and I, I think definitely in a more of an environment it would have been easier for her for example to hop on a bus or maybe take a subway and and there'd probably be more than one library within the vicinity so um I think that would definitely have an impact. I also just think the type of people she would have encountered, she would have been encountering a lot more people, maybe, maybe a lot more people who could have helped her. <laughs> so it, it's the isolation of the place contributes to, in some ways, it's, it's danger because there's this, the, the villain is this powerful guy who has a hold over this small town called Willoughby. And she really doesn't have many places to turn to 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 help go against him because it's like her it's her family um and and he's controlling this small the small town so uh it, it would have been an interesting book it definitely would have been a different book um yeah who knows <laughs> it's like an alternate universe so that's the way <laughs> i was thinking about um another couple of things one is the connection to her ancestral stories and how yes. they take place in a place that is very similar it's, it's the same to where she is only yes. like you know long ago so um so i think that that also like it sort of grounds her in a way um that may not feel the same um in mm -hmm. a cityscape and then the other thing was um so thinking about your background in biology is that the the science of the place what makes the place strange what makes the place seem off to ellie and and to anyone who's paying attention is that it's in south texas and it's very green um yes. right and so like that wouldn't be necessarily as noticeable in, in a cityscape because there's not as much green space available because there's oh. more green. And there's more buildings that's um, a good point yes um it's essentially transplanted from an area in new england and it's like right that, that's like one of the things she finds out um but yeah that, that she wouldn't have known that clue <laughs> right like that and and i feel like a lot of what happens in in the book in terms of her like solving 
the mystery that's involved has to do with that the strangeness the weirdness of of it being so green when it shouldn't be green at all yeah. um or you know if it if it is green it's like succulents <laughs> you know <laughs> <Exactly. Yes. laughs> you know not like daffodils or you know like <laughs> grass um and so like that to me, when I was reading, I was like, place is really important to this story in so many different ways. And it's just another reminder to me um, and hopefully to anybody who chooses to teach the book or asks students to engage with it, like that this is a way that we can be critical and we can think critically about the way that place impacts how people interact with their world, the way that they understand it and what they do in it. Um, so anyway, I just, I was kind of, sometimes I think about that when I'm reading, like if this, mm -hmm. if this rural book that I'm reading was set in a city, like how would it, how would it be different? And so that was the kind of a, a couple of things that I was thinking about, but the point about getting permission to use the car and having to drive quite a ways, um, to get to the nearest library. The fact that there was a library was really awesome to me because where I'm from, there is no library in my small town. So yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of times people use the library as a way to say like, oh, if you if you can't buy books, you know, twenty dollars, go to your library. And there's there's a big group of, of the population, including a lot of young readers who really can't just go out and do that. Um, and that's something that I, I think especially like educators have to think about, like, what if my kid really just can't go out there and just grab a free book from the library because there there is no library for them to go to. Um, right. Or the library that they can go to is their school library. Mm -hmm. You know, well, like that's that. why it's so important. <laughs> yeah. And that's why it's so important for those libraries to have diverse literature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get on a book banning soapbox. <laughs> well, no. Yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> but oh. I think it's, but I think it's particularly concerning for rural places um, mm -hmm. who have people. Um, and I think this is getting sort of to another one of my questions. Um, yeah. That, you know, rural America the story about it is often that it's this white monolith of mm -hmm. um, people who are you know um, conservative like hyper conservative uh, Christian racist and homophobic um, mm -hmm. but we know that that's not true it's you yeah. know that that maybe is true of some people in rural places but that's also true of some people in urban spaces yeah. um so i think you know thinking about the intersectional identities that exist in rural spaces and how like the libraries really need to reflect all of those different stories um that's just super super important and so thinking about um the experiences of rural people of color, including indigenous folks, um, but also members of the queer community and, and you know, all other marginalized and historically yeah. excluded people groups. Um, I just, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about how those intersections um, mm -hmm. show up in rural YA literature and how they're made available. Um, and I was telling you before we started this that I was listening to Read Appalachia and Kendra was talking with Annette Sanuk Clapsaddle, um, who is a member of the Eastern Band Cherokee, which a lot of people don't think exist anymore. Like they think that all of the Cherokee people were moved to Oklahoma, um, yeah. you know, if they know about the Trail of Tears or whatever. Um, but that's not true. There are still some Cherokee um, in Appalachia. Um, a clap saddle is from North Carolina, I believe. And she talked about how she was the first um, Eastern Band Cherokee member to publish a book and how people usually clap for her. Like that's some like, you know, like th that it's awesome. Yeah. And she's like, we've had a written language for 2000 years. The fact that mm -hmm. the fact that I am now the first person to just publish you know, <laughs> recently is shameful, not, you know, not awesome. So let's not clap for it. Let's recognize that there are other, you know, indigenous authors out there um, who are writing, who deserve to be published. And the big five or, you yeah. know, like indie presses have a hard time, you know, um, representing their authors because of capital um which is another mm -hmm. issue um but anyway so i just thinking about all of those things and all of those thoughts swirling in my head i i was wondering um what your take on that 
would be not not to make you sort of like the representative of all <laughs> American people who are writers or not, but um, just your opinion because of your identity positions. Like, what do you think about yeah. that? I, and I would say that that I'm an example of somebody who's queer and who's um, indigenous who grew up in Texarkana and as, as a teenager, which is the age group that I'm writing for right now and, and an age group where I think it's very important because a lot of these kids, I know I certainly felt like I was, I was alone in many ways. And yet I was around other people like me who also felt alone. And it doesn't help when there's these blanket statements that essentially erase us and our, our existence and our struggles and our, our happiness and the way we connect with our friends and like all, all of these very human experiences that we are having um, in quote unquote, like these red areas, like, no, we're people. There's, there's going to be like gay people everywhere, you know, uh, but it, it, so it's important to me as I'm writing uh, just to be aware to, of that. And, and I think about how, when I was young, I never really read about people like me. And I, I mean that in terms of many elements of my identity, um, especially though my my cultural uh, identity. I'm, I'm lip on Apache and uh, we used to be a lot more numerous, uh, but now I'd say even, even thinking of people who aren't enrolled because they are out there and they're also valid. Um, there's probably maybe like 10,000 or less of us. <laughs> so there, there's not a lot of lip on people um, so unfortunately, I am ending up doing a lot of first in terms of publishing for the lip on. Um, and it it can be a little bit a little bit sad. For example, I'm the first native writer to be recognized by the Newberry committee in a hundred years. And when I heard that, I actually didn't believe it. At first, I was like, that can't be true because, you know, I'd, I'd read books that were about Native characters that had received Newberry honors um, and medals. And, and I was like, they're, like I can't be in 100 years because this isn't just lip on people. This is any Native person writing. Um, but it turns out those were written by non-Native authors. So, yeah. Uh, so that was, I, I, I kind of understand that, that feeling where on the, on the one hand, like I'm very proud of my books and just as a writer, I'm just so happy that, that they're being recognized and and it it's not something I expected. So it really has blown me away. I still can't quite wrap my head around it. Um, but on the other hand, it is a little bit sad because you think, well, there, there are so many artists out there who probably deserve similar recognition and didn't get it in the past. So what I'm really hoping for is that the future is, I, I mean, I'm certain that in the future there's going to be more um, and I look about, I look at imprints like Heart Drum that is now publishing a lot of new fiction by um, indigenous writers from, you know, all across, not just the United States, but also Canada. And um, it's, it's very encouraging. And I look at young writers, young poets, like my um, sister-in-law Kinsale recently started the Indian Girls Book Club. Uh, and it features a lot of just uh, wonderful like readers and creators, and they're all so so uh, so young. And I'm like, you're the future. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely, I think it's something that, and, and you mentioned there's a lot of like book bannings and challengings, and a lot of these are focused on LGBTQ books, uh, books that deal with. Uh, uh, just different races. I don't, I don't understand why they're being challenged, but they are. Um, and what really, what really makes me sad is that there are kids out there who are seeing books about people like them mm -hmm. that are, that are, and they're being told that there's something wrong with them and they aren't able to access these stories that might make them happy, that might give them some form of of validation and know that there are people out there who are like them and who love them. Um, so it, it is, it is very um, troubling. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll, what I'll keep doing is I'll keep writing books <laughs> yes. like that. And, and I'm grateful for people who fight for the access, uh, you know, for, for students um, 
and a lot of librarians are in that tough spot right now. <laughs> and English teachers too. English teachers, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think back to like, I taught in a rural school and, um, and the number of my students who came out after they graduated was yeah. incredible and also disheartening. You know, they were, I had some students who were out while they were in school. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't, I'm sure that they faced just ridiculous, <laughs> just ridiculous, you know, unfounded hatred um yeah. while they were in school and I'm sure other folks saw it more than me as a teacher because people tend to censor that kind of crap around teachers right yeah, um, so um so like uh, my students knew that my classroom was a safe space um mm. but even still like mm. so many of them came out afterwards and I just I think back to the books that I invited students to read um, and they, they weren't books that would have given them a mirror, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sad about that. And I'm sorry about that. So I'm doing like, I'm doing my best to, mm -hmm. you know, to like make this work sort mm -hmm. of a, an apology to them. Um, and to say like, I wish I would have been a better teacher um, while I was in oh, the classroom. No. I'm just going to say the fact that your classroom was a safe place, it just means so much. Like, I I wouldn't, don't give yourself a hard time. I mean, I, you know, I just, and, and we would have some, I remember having some difficult conversations, um, especially around the op-ed unit was always one where like, you know, people just really wanted to, to pick at things. And I would try to have, I tend to get really impassioned about things. <laughs> and I would try to have more like, logical discussions <laughs> with my students um but I but I did I I tried um I tried to humanize everyone who was in my classroom mm -hmm. and who yes. wasn't um and so I hope that that landed with with some folks um but uh but yeah I just I I I would do it differently now um even if it meant losing my job I would do it differently now. Um, but I say that from a place of privilege because I'm not there anymore. So, mm -hmm. but, but the people who are making these hard decisions about soft censoring or not, um, yeah. or hard censoring or not, like I do not envy them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I, I wish I knew how to better support them because, um, because students deserve to read books for their, their lives are represented because when we read we see what kinds of identities are possible and what kind mm -hmm. of identities are counted as good identities to have yes. um and i try to at least make every episode a little bit about this because i really get yeah. annoyed um that the the dominant narrative persists that yeah. all rural places are you know white conservative racists and homophobes waving bad flags and doing bad things um when that's not the case and that we're missing crucial crucial narratives crucial stories from yeah people. um yeah absolutely so so thank you for writing them um <laughs> really appreciate that <laughs> um and I, so i think that covers the the next question that i was gonna ask <laughs> so we can move on um um but i'm curious too about like um every author that I talk to when they give recommendations to, to young folks who also want to be writers is that to be a good writer, you have to be a reader, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always curious about what writers are reading. So what are you reading? Do you have any recommendations? Oh for Let me, uh, <laughs> uh, so they're in my bedroom. I, I recently got like a big stack of books from the library. And what I've been kind of doing is I like read the first few sentences. And if I, if I am not into it, I don't. So I have a lot of those that I haven't really gotten into. I've started something called The Last House on Needless Street. I believe that's the title. And so far, it's hooked my attention. But it's kind of like a dark fantasy uh, adult book. And definitely, uh, uh, I, I tend to lean towards the, the horror side when I'm reading. Um, like, I love horror. I love mysteries. I'll read fantasy, but I tend to like things that give me the chills a little bit. Um, so that's my that's my current read. 
Um, but I, I've not, I'm not very far into it, uh, but so far I enjoy it. And I, I, am pretty sure it's, it's, uh, it's, it's won a bunch of awards. So it's, it's, it's a book that a lot of people enjoy as well. <laughs> cool. I actually never was a horror reader. Um, but I have had communication with Rob Costello. I don't know if you know Rob or not, but, um, he's amazing. Um, I love him. And um, he was like, have you ever thought about how rural places are sort of overrepresented in like horror yes. and dark, like, you know, um, dark stories because mm -hmm. it, the isolation freaks people out and it's a nice plot device in, in terms of like keeping people who are in trouble away from help, you know, um, but there yes. are other aspects of that too. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, you know, I've never, I used to like horror movies when I was younger, but I sort of got away from them. Um, and so he was like, well, here are some books that I think that you should read. So I read um, um, All of These Bodies by Kendra Blake. Oh, let me write these down. Oh, okay. I'm gonna type them. I'm gonna type them down. <laughs> okay. Um, it's kind of like uh, Capote's In Cold Blood if it was a YA novel and also sort of mixed with like vampire story. Ooh. Um, Adam Caesar's uh, Clown in a Cornfield. Oh, I, yeah, that one. <laughs> I heard of that one. <laughs> super good and what I love about it is that it is a really perfect example of how horror stories are not fluff that they mm -hmm. they like really dig into the primal empathy of humanity and the things that we are all scared of um and also it's a resource extraction community um and it um sort of makes readers question the uh dominant deficit narrative that young people are inherently stupid and yeah. Um, yeah you know so so that one was really good um and then I read uh Dead in the Dark by Courtney Gold huh? really really good um Pacific Northwest um it's also a queer um that was super good that was a good one and then I'm trying to think of what else this poison heart is kind of dark fantasy. It's not super yeah. super dark, but um, I love Kaylin Bayron, and that book was so good. I tore through that and this Wicked Fate. Um, dark and Shallow Lies by Jenny Meyer Sane. Have you read that? No, I haven't. Oh, it's so good. And she just wrote <laughs> another one called Secret So Deep. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there. I could recommend a million things, but um, those those are really really good. So um, hopefully, if you get a chance you all enjoy yes. it and um, that's the thing because I, it's good to have titles I usually go to the library and I get I like I don't there's so many like books and not a lot of like guidance of which ones are what you're looking for so it's good to have the titles like up front where you can go and get them yeah um or at least like look them up and sort of know mm -hmm. you know what they're about what I really appreciated about um Dark and Shallow Lies was that it um it takes place in rural Louisiana um, yeah. and features um, Acadian Cajun Creole language, um, which is also like insanely underrepresented in, in books. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, all of those, all of those were really, really good. I loved Kendare Blake's book. I really did. Because um, I loved Capote's in Cold Blood too. Um, so so I hope that you get a chance to check them out and you like them. Um, I think we're probably, are we okay on time? I'm really bad about paying attention to time. I think we're, we're 2.52, so eight minutes until the hour. Okay, perfect. We're doing great. Because I yes. only have one last question. Right. And that is, um, do you have anything in the works that you want to talk about? Yes. Oh, and I wish that, so I just turned in the first draft to my editor and Sunday so it's a, also a book I wish I could have talked about during this podcast because place is just so mm -hmm. important um and I can't say too much more without giving away obviously it's in Texas but uh yeah I I, I wish I could I I as you were talking about a place I was like oh my gosh I have this book that I just like submitted a draft for and I have it's so relevant to this subject but it's 
Um, it is a third YA book that I've written, and hopefully people who enjoy Lats Away will be into this one. Something I always, I'm, I'm always like uncertain when I put a book out into the world what the reception will be. And really at that point, you just kind of have to hope uh, that, that it'll connect with people. So that's what I'm going to do after I make all the edits. And I'm sure that my editor will get back with, because it's in a state where my first drafts always need work. So I'm, I'm looking forward to those. Uh, so hopefully that will come out in the very near future, uh, maybe 2024. And there's a couple of uh, short stories and anthologies that actually are coming out soon. Um, so the the second New Sons anthology, I I wrote a story um, that is it's, it's very personal to me uh, because it it was inspired by. What my brother went through working uh, at Target in the year 2020, and so the 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 hero of this story is is very much like my brother, um, and it, it also takes place in a rural area. Uh, and the second the second story that's coming out is in the Book of Witches, and it, it's it's about this uh, woman who who has this power. Uh, every lie she tells, people can believe they'll believe it, but every truth she tells, they disbelieve it. So it's it's her and she has this little adventure. It was super fun to write because it takes place in Las Vegas, but <laughs> uh, that's where the other side of my family, a lot of them live there and work there. Um, and yeah, those that's what I have coming up. <laughs> cool. Well, I will definitely be keeping an eye out for those, including the short stories. Um, I feel like short stories... I feel like there's like a resurgence, you know, like there are a lot of anthologies that are coming out. And I think mm -hmm. teachers, as a teacher, I would love that because there are so yes. many that, you know, like if you buy one book, there are so many different stories that you can teach um, from that one book. And so, it, so many different perspectives, so many different, you know, like, I just feel like that's really, so I, I would have loved to have had something like Rural Voices or, you know, um, really any any anthology would have been great other than like the textbook I was given you know yeah, uh, yeah. but uh that's awesome I'll definitely keep an eye out for those um do you have any parting words for aspiring young writers um definitely I guess there's a couple of, of words of advice I can give the first is that the writing journey doesn't have to follow any one set path. So when I was in high school, I thought I would have to get like an MFA degree and study writing at college. And a lot of people think they they have to use, move to New York City or, or a place like that where a lot of publishing pros are in order, in order to get published. And, and I have to say for me, that's not what happened at all. Um, and I turned out okay. And it, it's definitely, if writing is something you love and, and it brings happiness, just keep at it and be be uh, persistent. It took me uh, over a decade of like to, to get anything published. But once I did, you know, it, it was worth it. It was worth all that work that I put into it. Um, so definitely your writing journey doesn't have to look like anyone else's writing journey um, because it's yours. And, and there's so many ways to get there. I love that. Um, well, on that beautiful note, um, we will end. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for writing. And thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate having the chance to talk to you. And um, hopefully we can sit down again sometime, some other time, maybe. Yes, that would be awesome. IRL, <laughs> thank you so much for, for having me on the podcast. And thanks to y'all for being here and listening and being on this journey through my conversation with Dr. Darcy Little Badger about where she's from, about how that inspires what she writes, about how her STEM background connects to her fi fiction writing, and all of the other wonderful things we talked about on this interview for the podcast. I appreciate y'all. I'm so glad that you were here with us, and I'm looking forward to next month when we will talk about my book, Country Teachers in City Schools, The Challenge of Negotiating Identity and Place, where I will not interview myself, but will be interviewed by Dr. Rob Patrone. And I'm excited for y'all to be a part of that conversation too. So, oh, and before you go, if you could do me the greatest kindness of sharing this show with your 
friends, family, loved ones, fellow teachers, colleagues, all of those people. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, even just a review on Apple Podcasts. You don't even have to write anything if you just leave some stars. Um, that would help tell that pesky algorithm to help other people find us. That would be amazing. And of course, interact with our social media posts and um, share and like and all of those things. Comment. Um, tell me how you're liking the show. Um, give suggestions for things that you would like to hear. All of those things I would love to see happen. So thanks for doing what you can. Okay, I'm signing off now for real this time. Y'all come back now, would you?